did the plays kill us? Alice Birch's Anatomy of a Suicide simultaneously follows three generations of troubled women and how it affects their marriage and children. This is a very difficult play to follow as there are three plays going on at once and it is hard to know which one to concentrate on as so a lot of the plot is lost. Because of this, I found the actors phenomenal as they had to focus on just their little world and continue as the other two scenes spoke throughout, overlapping as it were. So this was a very interesting experiment, but it failed on me. I'm giving it a mixed minus. Second Stage has a play by Young Jean Lee, directed and choreographed by Roger Feather Kelly, called We're Gonna Die. As a statement, that's true, but it's also very banal. And here, Janelle McDermott sings a number of songs um, about all her problems growing up and people in her family or ones that she loved who died. And some of the little stories are interesting. There's an ancient grandma who grabs her with a clawed hand and tells her just about how painful life towards the end is. Um, but then she says, but that's a good thing because otherwise it would be too hard to um, want to give up and die. Um, I like some of the songs. They were catchy enough, but I really just couldn't get into this sort of self-congratulatory smug celebration of death. Now, see, I, again, disagree. Mm -hmm. I found it very moving and compelling, and I was just really got into it, and I thought the one hour was perfect, and it just, it makes you, like, we are, yes, we're going to die, but it just makes it not so painful, the way it was told. And some of the music, like this one, like, lullaby, by and by, it made me cry. It was just, it just made me happy and sad, and it just, it really got my emotions in one hour, and, and it was just, I liked it a lot. I, I did not find it smug or battle or any of those things. Negative, I didn't find anything negative. Yeah, again, for me, it really is an hour I would have rather spent maybe, you know, reading a book or on the toilet. But at any <laughs> rate, I, I'm giving it mixed. Not me. Vivian Newer's Mr. Tool, directed by Cat Parker. This is my third version. I saw a 20-minute version at Esther Genius. I saw another version at Midtown International Theater Festival, 2014, 2016, 2020, of 59 is 59 screen. It's about the guy that wrote A Confederacy of Dunces, living in New Orleans with his parents, who call him Ken, and Lisette, who has a crush on him. Who is a po He's a poetry professor, and he's talking about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And the poem mirrors his life of how not daring will destroy you, how it is a love song to hope that can be death and heartbreak, and yet the poem can still make you smile. There's this Tennessee Williams quality to it, and it's intriguing to see how this play is developing about one of the saddest chapters and how a young artist's dreams are crushed by constant rejection. He knows that he has written the greatest book. He feels that no one will ever get to read this book he worked so hard on, and his mother... She's the one that finally gets this book published so we can all enjoy a confederacy of dunces. This is saddens and intrigues, and I love this in all three versions. At the main stage in um, Irish Rep, we have poet Paul Muldoon's uh, Incantata, which is directed by Sam Yates and performed by a very busy Stanley Townsend. It seems to be a lamentation by the poet for a woman, Mary Falls, uh, Mary Fall Powers, who he loved, but it's so dense, the poetry, that maybe if you read it, it makes sense, but to me it just seemed like I was trapped in a long discourse in a foreign language, in a foreign culture, with words and names that occasionally popped out, but I didn't know why they were talking about them. Um, her imagery seemed to be something with potato prints and army worms, and she um, refused um, Western medical treatment, so she probably died a lot earlier than she should have. I feel sad for her, but <laughs> I just couldn't get much out of the poem. I feel sadder for us because to me it was complete gobbledygook. I had no idea what the heck was going on. I totally gave up. I'm like, it was completely over my head. Go see Lady G instead. It was delicious. It's divine. We're going to talk about our next show March 28th. And I'm giving this an unhappy face because I was just dreadful. Mixed faces plus. There seemed to be a lot of effort. 
Greg Codis's I Am Nobody is about corporate espionage, how technology is taking over us and we might we must fight against modernity. Nathaniel and Lucas work for Mr. Charles and Franklin Industries making these deluxe super secret microchips. While they are at a bar to listen to Nathaniel's crush Naomi, a singing waitress, Lucas has a nervous breakdown. He ends up stealing microchips in Nathaniel's car. Naomi and Nathaniel chase cross country after him in Mr. Chase's electric super car with a stop in the country where we meet Naomi's mom who is into clean back to nature living. Will they stop Lucas before he implements his crazy scheme to destroy everything we hold dear? Can Nathaniel convince Naomi to love him instead of Lucas? What do the toddler twins and Naomi's heads have to say about all this? Being the letter they am, I got a real charge out of this. It's a pleasure having the wacky world of Greg Codis' imagination back in full throttle happy face. At the New Ohio, we saw the Karamazovs, written and directed by Anna Brenner in collaboration with the group of people performing it. It's from Fyodor Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, but here there's only one brother and two sisters, and a um, the woman's servant who's narrating and occasionally voicing <laughs> um, the father, and it makes a very complicated multi, multi-character novel uh, pruned to the point where you really don't know what's going on. The narrative gets lost and the gender reversal doesn't seem to make sense in a novel that really was about all different kinds of problems about um, masculinity. And having um, a female alley going to a monastery where probably women wouldn't be allowed. It was ridiculous, <laughs> but not in the good Charles Ludlam way. No, but the it, performers were not bad. I mean, I, I mean, it, it opened up kind of with they're, they're in these outlandish, gorgeous costumes yeah. by um, o o Oana Botts. Bodas, whatever, and they did this wonderful little dance, and I love Dostoevsky's Karanov's of Brothers. I've read it a million times. I mean, I'm sorry they didn't put in the onion scene, because that's my favorite bit in the book, and it made no sense, like he said. It was just, it was quite dreadful, and they needed, they needed someone to actually play Fyodor Dostoevsky's you know, um, Karanov's. The father. I mean, to have this woman take a microphone and scream out these things, it was just, you know, get another actor, come on, really. So I'm giving it a mix. It was very disappointing. Uh, Emoji Land with uh, Laura Nicole Harrison's and Keith Harrison's book, music, and lyrics. It's a pop culture musical with silly characters, and they've devised a musical based on emojis found in smartphones, like Smiley Face and Sunny and Construction Worker and Police Officer. And they all have you know relationships with each other. And there's a princess who likes to order people about, and the bad guy is Skull, and he. He gets Nerd Face to help him with his evil plans. And normally I like these fringy, absurd musicals, but it was hard to watch with the constant motion and light flashing. So I basically just listened to it, but the audience seemed to like it. And it's got this incredible cast. I mean, Leslie Margarita um, and other people. So I'm giving it, I'm happy for the show and all those lights and everything that made me nauseous and happy face for the cast. Finally, a Russian play and a musical that we both loved at the Sheen Center is About Love, which is inspired by Turgenev's First Love, music and lyrics by Nancy Harrow, script and direction by Will Pomerantz, and it concerns Peter, who's 16 years old, on summer vacation with his family, and he falls in love with an older, 21-year-old girl living next door, who's considerably more experienced and more complicated than Summer he of is. 1833. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, she has this whole coterie of men who are fawning on her and obeying all her orders, but she seems very disturbed because there might be something hidden that she can't tell Peter. Also, and, she's kind of fed up with all, you know, that she can order these people about and they'll just, just jump, jump, jump. And she wants to be controlled. It's like she wants someone to she find... She wants a man to break her. Yes, which is, it's not a very good Me Too play, but it's Russian back in the 1830s, for God's sake. I loved it. I, I mean, loved it, too. The music, it's, we it's a play with music. It's not a full musical, but the six songs they have are all really good, especially the one that's supposed to be 
you know, it's a modern song, but it's supposed to be an old Russian folk song. It's wonderful. All the other performers do multiple roles and juggle them really brilliantly. And I just want to say, Peter, played by Jeffrey Kringer, went to Fredonia, my hometown territory. And you could just tell, he reminded me of my day, Jack Darling, so I thought he was a darling boy. <laughs> I think he's a star in the making. He seems incredibly talented. Also, um, I never realized how much um, Chekhov's The Seagull got from um, First Love. Oh! It, really, there's a lot in it. It's no, a great oh, oh, story. Sorry, I, my whole, I want to hold up my happy face. Yes. Yay, we, we agree, we Finally, love Finally, something worth seeing. Run out. Another play with song. Ethan Lipton's Tumacho is just as hysterical as the first two times I have seen it. Catalina is out for revenge against the notorious Bill, who takes real pleasure in taking out the citizens of this unfortunate western town. The only remaining citizens left that haven't been fled or killed are the overworked doctor, overwrought Goody Two-Shoes Prudence, overwhelmed mayor, who has a crush on Barkeep Alice, who is only staying in town to look after her gramps. Things are no picnic when one of these candidates ends up possessed by the gluttonous, evil, too macho. And the cook chappy tries to appease this too macho with his culinary expertise. Can this town be saved? Is there no end to the onslaught of slaughter? Not even the cacti are faith are safe. The cast is impeccable. This is the funniest show you will ever see. I cannot recommend this enough. This is one humdinger with gunslingers and zingers and this gets a happy face and beyond. When we think of Shakespeare, too many of us remember being forced to plod through ages of tiny print, confused by the vocabulary and turned off by the cultural references. This is truly a chance to remedy that. With well-chosen rock and roll, original music, and some of the most consistently well-spoken Elizabethan dialect in New York City, Hamlet Isn't Dead has created an entertainment for the ages. Identical twins Viola and Sebastian are shipwrecked, then separated before being washed ashore in the dukedom of Illyria. Believing Sebastian to be dead, Viola discovers herself as a boy and enters the service of Duke Orsino, with whom she almost immediately falls in love, which leads to all sorts of confusion when Sebastian turns up and is mistaken as his sister. Director James Reitmeyer Jr. and his company are simply remarkable. They sound as if they speak Elizabethan English every day. Their dialogue is beautifully spoken, every subtlety made clear, nor is it confused by attempts to sound like Laurence Olivier. Just saying the lines as they normally speak and understand what they're saying makes Shakespeare's immortal work real and accessible. Add to that their continuing effort to attract young audiences and Shakespearean newbies, and it's why this is one of my favorite companies. Happy Face Plus. A plus Happy Face. Lauren Yee's Cambodian rock band is about Cambodia's relationship with the United States during the Vietnam War, Pol Pot's rise to power with all his atrocities, and present day where Neary is building a case against Doik, who ran a notorious death camp. Out of 20,000 or more prisoners, only eight survived. Neary is searching for a mysterious eight that is still alive today to interview in order to convict Doik for a long time. Neary's father unexpectedly dropped in on her after fleeing Cambodia many years ago and never talking about his time there. Secrets are finally uncovered, but is that enough to heal wounds of the past and build a new relationship with his country and daughter? There are moments of a Ara Thousand and One Arabian Nights and the dilemma of a Sophie's choice over friendship. What will a human being do in order to survive? What lines will you cross? The band was really rocking with some excellent music musicianship. Laura Nee has written a solid and compelling play. Che Yu has directly directed this, keeping us on our toes while the band is tapping our toes. And it really makes you think about good and evil. I give this a major, major, major happy face. Go see this. It's a brilliant play. J. Julian Christopher's Bundle of Sticks introduces us to five enrollees at the Global Conversion Therapy Center, a real place in Cooper Pedy, Australia. The play explores stories of an assortment of gay men who are seeking to become straight. It should be noted that none of the six characters are played by men, and the play contains what I can only describe as much explicit sexuality. Its great strength is its fascinating handling of honesty versus dishonesty with one's world or with oneself, and how persistent dishonesty can lead to perversion of the soul. The play's great drawback is its occasional trite foray into current LGBTQ propaganda. For example, homosexuality must not be a choice because obviously no one in their right mind would ever choose it. 
Uh, to be fair, however, Bill Cataldi, who wrote this review, is a homosexual man who's lived with this cliché and propaganda his entire adult life, so what's propaganda for him might not be for someone else. Lou Marino directed Bundle of Sticks with only a small, awkward space and limited assets for set, lighting, and sound. His attention focused on the actors, sharpening their performances into precise and powerful instruments. It's an excellent production. See it. I give it a happy face minus. Paul Mazursky and Larry Tucker's movie Bob and Carol, Ted and Alice has been adapted into a musical with a book by Jonathan Mark Sherman, music by Duncan Sheik, and lyrics by Duncan Sheik and Amanda Green. One can only ask why they thought a story about the swinging end of the 60s decades would make an entertaining musical. Bob and Carol go to a treat. They lose all sense of inhibitions and prop proportions and just rely on their feelings. This is very worrisome to their uptight friends, Ted and Alice, where they all end up in bed together, but it takes till the end of the play to do that. Can a love triangle accommodate squares? Um, the, uh, let's see. The talented actors were wasted on this moronic dated dribble. In the end, you shouldn't get out of bed to see this. This gets an uh, unhappy face way more on Facebook. It's a funny review. Terrible show. Building the Walls, written by Robert Schenken and directed by Natalie Moreno. It's, it's one of the most confusing things we have seen. It is in Spanish and it's with supertitles. But the supertitles I could not really read. I don't know about Eva because there was too much light. And with and, me it went by way too fast to read. And this this is a prisoner. He's in an orange garb with his, his handcuffs. We do not know why, what commit, uh, crimes he committed. And there's a lady, uh, we don't know, she's a professor or something, she's interrogating him. And it goes from place to place to place. It starts with like, I thought was with Trump, but then it goes to Iraq war. Makes no sense. Towards the end is, a, is another, some fictional Something, something. It is not a very good production. It's no, very I, disappointing. It, it made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. I don't know what the heck was going on. And I, I mean, I really tried to like it. It but was, it, no, it was just as bad as Incantata. To be fair, people who can speak Spanish would probably enjoy this, and they probably know the situation and know what's going on better than what we did. Because, but you see, it was developed in Costa Rica, and the Costa Rica company is producing it with the with the Latea Theater. And maybe that is the problem, because we didn't really understand everything. Last chance is tonight, um, March 14th, to see Theater 2020 Sondheim on Sondheim, a rare glimpse into the man behind God that we worship as musical theater's greatest composer and lyricist. Extremely talent, talented cast of eight all get a chance to shine with songs that we know, we don't know, that have been discarded. Basically, it is a film documentary of Sondheim's life as told by Sondheim with their home movies and childhood photos. We learn how he creates these innovative shows, his troubled childhood, his great mentor, Oscar Hammett, with an extremely talented cast of eight, we hear various songs, versions of songs before we hear the ones we know. How the wrong number at the wrong place could ruin a show. How important a hummable tune is and how many more nuggets of information. This gets a major, 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 major happy face. Mirrors, a world premiere of a play by Azura D. Osborne Lee and directed by Ludwika Villar Hauser at the next door. Uh, New York Theatre Workshop next door. And it's Parity a, Productions. Parity Productions. It's a very intriguing play. Because it takes place in a fictional town, Etheridge, in 1960 Mississippi, and the main character named Bird is, is a queer, she's like a black woman also, you know. And uh, she's very isolated because the town gossip women, they just cannot stand her, and they're always gossiping and all that stuff. And then she had a lover who moved somewhere else, and then... Bell. Bell and whose ghost appears, which is fascinating in the beginning, but appears a couple of times, you know, and uh, and she leaves behind a daughter that uh, it comes to Bird's place to live, and you know this daughter she didn't think much of her mother who was never around, and she's not and she doesn't know this Bird stranger at all, and Bird finds it very hard to raise a teenager, so she goes to Louise, her new lover and neighbor, to help her out because she's it's all, she's overwhelmed and those gossipy women they were hysterical. Oh, they were. I mean, Ludwika did a good job. She did a good direction thing, you know. But With the beautiful singing. We be be I love the singing. I wanted a little bit more. But the only problem I had, that the play was very abrupt ending. Because all of a sudden, we, when the secret is finally revealed, it's like, Oh, that puts a whole different spin on everything, and you kind of like want to go with that storyline. So you kind of want a sequel. Yeah, but I still enjoyed this play because I love the black actors and singing and everything. So it's happy face minus. Happy face minus for me too. 
Women's History Solo Show Series is going on at 14th Street Y. Uh, you have Ricarda Abrams repl reprising her Mary McLeod Bethon First by Faith, which she did here. She did at the National Black Theatre Company. It's all about Mary Beth McLeod Bethune, who did all these wonderful things for, for education. And she was a child of like 100,000 children. And it's really very engaging and wonderful. Then you have the real story of the Mona Lisa, which is uh, Jenny Lynn Bader's Equally Divine, the real story of the Mona Lisa, has Mona Lisa letting down her hair and spilling the paint on her creator and abductor. Because this is Paris 1911. When Mona Lisa was famously stolen by Vincenzo Perugia, the inept French chief of police, even with 60 detectives, couldn't find her. She was missing for two years, and this is told from Mona Lisa's point of view. She clears up many mysteries as to what her name really is, what her profession was, and her relationship to Leonardo, his dalliances, and how the painting ended up in France in the first place. And then we have Cheer from Chawton, which is um, a Jane Austen family theatric. Um, and that is um, Karen Ederovich, and it's a charming story about Jane Austen hosting the family at Christmas time with traditions. She reads excerpts and how she came to write them and how the characters were created, and Ederovich has a very impish glint, and all three are just delightful. You learn a lot. It's a lot of fun, and it's fabulous, and you should go. A Pulitzer Award winner play, Soldier's Play by Charles Fuller, it takes takes place in an army base at the time of the World War II. They're all black soldiers, you know. And there's also begins with fantastic singing. You know, I just like, uh, my heart goes out to that. Very wonderful set and all that stuff. And it's directed by Kenny Leon. But then there's a murder happen. And this sergeant who had been very, very nasty, nasty black man to his own black people, he's killed. David Allen Greer. David Allen Greer. And then, then uh, a lawyer. Blair Underwood. Blair Underwood come to investigate, and he's black. And uh, the white officer's kind of like, this, Connell, is, this, is, this is the first time we have seen a black officer and all that. And then everybody kind of assumed that a white person must have killed the uh, sergeant, but yeah, it's not the case. Yeah, because they figure it's on south, and they figure it's got to be the Ku Klux Klan. Or it could be these nasty, you know, um, oh, what do they call those MPs, you know, my, that were taunting them all the time. Yeah, because you see, he, 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 he was very, very, very tough, and a lot of soldiers did not like him. Yeah, because yeah. He, he wanted to maintain the black dignity, and he felt if, if the black man, you know, sang or did anything, you know, cliche that it would bring down the whole black race. Yeah, but he was a very unhappy person. In one scene it revealed that he says they are still doing it to us. He hated the white people, but at the same time he wanted to keep this facade that we are so good when mm -hmm. we get the authority we're going to uh, mm -hmm. follow the rules and all that stuff. He overdid it. Mm -hmm. and uh, But then at the end, we find out. Duh, uh, we, I we, mean, it's a different ending. You know, it's, yeah. it's not what we were expecting. Well, yeah. I think it's a wonderful play, very nicely directed. I love the singing. I love the acting. And I just... Yeah, it's an exceptional cast, very well directed by yeah. Kenny Leon. I, Kenny Leon is a very good director. I really enjoyed the play. It's a very happy face from yeah, I'm side. glad they finally brought it to Broadway. Because mm -hmm. it hasn't even... It's, it's been done off-Broadway, but never on Broadway. So it's a it's only got going on this weekend till March 15th. So we even have time to talk about Lady G at the Irish Rep that we mentioned before. It's in the intimate downstairs space and it concerns uh, Lady Augusta Gregory who along with William Butler Yeats sort of established the Abbey Theatre and Dublin and really were central to the Irish Renaissance of the early 20th century and it deals with her life, her loves, her um, through her nanny learning about Irish culture and wonderful old Irish songs and all these um, people that she got involved with, uh, including Singh and O'Casey and really making the Abbey Theater great and um, establishing Irish culture. And we even get two of the plays that she wrote herself called Workhouse, Workhouse Ward about 
two cantankerous old <laughs> men who, who really enjoy sparring with each other. And then there's McDonough's wife, which is about this great bagpipe player who returns home to find his wife dead, and the whole town doesn't want to bury her properly because they can't stand her because she's an outsider. And, you know, is art, you know, important? And, and, and it's got this great cast of uh, Una Clancy, Terry Donnelly, John Keating, and James Russell. And this was so good. And you get a little treat. You get to try, try Lady Gregory's delicious cooking. And this is perfect for Irish Rep because it's really the, uh, about the history of the plays that they champion, they present so lovingly to the New York audience that's devoted to the Irish Rep, and well, it should be. So this is super great. Yes. Sorry had a rush of the review, so go to our Facebook page, and you can read the reviews in a calm manner, and there's a lot more of the review also on our Facebook page. Harry Townsend is still going on, but now with David Lansbury instead of Craig Bierko. And a lot of shows are closing March 29th, which we'll talk about on the next show, March 28th. But we're all going to see these. We'll talk about them. But you should see them beforehand because they're all going to be fantastic, especially Unknown Soldier. Mark and I both love that one. Valerie David is back in the Pink Hulk inside Broadway's having their gala with Ben Vereen. Encores is back with Love Life, and that's March 2018 to 22. A View for the Bridge is having a benefit reading. Woman on Fire is back. Uh, lots of Sondheim stuff is going on at 54 Below. And there's some cool people at Panagia. And I saw No Strings from the J2 Spotlight Musical, and they're doing a class act next. It's going to be brilliant. A lot of cool stuff going on at 92nd Street Y. And Theater for the City, New Barbara Khan. Penny Arcade is going to be at La Mama with the Coffee House Chronicle. Also on our next show, we'll talk about Happy Birthday, Doug, and the 5090s, 5090s stuff, Unsinkable Molly Brown, The Fred from Taylor Mac, Cold Country at The Public, Hot Wing we're going to talk about, and Dana H., and Sign of the Times, and The Siblings. Remember, go to our Facebook page. You could go to e subscribe to Eva Heinem on YouTube. You get the show even sooner. Twitter. And all these shows from Frigid we talked about, you can read our reviews on the Facebook page. All of these we saw on the Facebook. Pick up your performing arts inside the cultural heartbeat of New York City. Next show is March 28th. And get Jan Ewing's book from Pop Books about his reviews. 